Needs little introduction, but he gets one anyway. <laughs> He's the Melvin G. Shim Distinguished Professor of Law. He writes and teaches in the areas of civil rights, con law, civ pro, state and local government, and legal history. His work has been published in the top law reviews, and his articles on the Second Amendment are regularly cited by federal courts, including by Justice Stevens in McDonald v. City of Chicago. Please look out for his forthcoming essay in the Duke Law Journal titled Historical Analogy and the Rule Morality of Reason Giving. Professor Andrew Willinger is the executive director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law and a Duke Law Lecturing Fellow. He is a Second Amendment and Firearms Law Scholar and has been quoted and interviewed by major news publications. And he writes regularly on Second Thoughts, the Center for Firearms Law's blog. His article, The Territories Under Text, History, and Tradition, published last fall in the Washington University Law Review, has already been cited by several federal courts. His latest piece, Missing Pieces, Gaps in the Record of Early American Decisional Law, is coming soon in the Duke Law Journal online. We're especially pleased to have Professor Willinger as an alum of Duke Law and the Duke Law Journal. Today's discussion requires a little bit of background um, on the Second Amendment. So in Heller, the Supreme Court said that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to keep a firearm in the home for self-defense. That was extended against the states in McDonald. And then in 2022, in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin, the court extended the right to carry outside the home. There, the court struck down a New York law that conditioned concealed carry permits on a special showing of need. Contrary to the post-Heller lower court consensus, the Supreme Court rejected tiers of scrutiny for Second Amendment analysis. Instead, when a regulation implicates the text of the Second Amendment, so it reaches the people, keep or bear, arms, Professor Miller, I know, has thoughts about just how far those plain words go, uh, the government must show that the regulation is consistent with the United States history and tradition of firearms regulation. So when a law is aimed at a long-standing societal ill, the modern law should be, in the court's words, distinctly similar to historical laws. When the problem addressed is novel, Bruin seems to allow a somewhat looser analogy. It directs judges and litigants to analogize the modern law to the how and the why of those historical regulations. Since Bruin, litigants have challenged many state and federal reg regulations, like 18 U.S.C. Section 922G, which is the major federal prohibition um, on firearm possession by a variety of individuals. This term, the Supreme Court heard a facial challenge to 922G8, uh, which prohibits possession by those subject to a domestic violence restraining order. That's the Rahimi case. Uh, the Fifth Circuit invalidated the law, noting that domestic violence is an old problem, but had never been addressed with regulations analogous to 922G8. At oral argument in the Supreme Court, the United States argued for a historical tradition restricting firearms to citizens who are law-abiding and responsible. Justice Jackson questioned what history counts under the Bruin test, and Justice Barrett flagged one of the other cases that's headed the court's direction, Garland v. Range, where the Third Circuit held that 922 G1, which prohibits possession by felons, was unconstitutional as applied. So with that background on the Second Amendment as it stands at the Supreme Court right now, I'll turn it over to Professors uh, Willinger and Miller to discuss their latest works and to give their thoughts on Bruin's tests and the issues raised in Rahimi. Then I'll take moderator's pr uh, prerogative, ask a couple questions, and then open it up to the audience. So Professor Willinger, would you like to take it away? Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Kyle, for that uh, generous introduction. And I just want to say on behalf of the Center for Firearms Law, thank you to the Duke Law Journal for co-hosting this event with us. Uh, you know, Professor Miller and I are very excited to be here talking about these especially timely and important issues, which uh, we, of course, spend a lot of time thinking and writing about. Um, I see some familiar faces in the audience, which is great. Um, but for those of you who, who haven't heard this already, um, I actually started in this position as executive director at the center on the day that Bruin was decided, uh, June 23rd, 2022. It was not planned out in advance. It just happened that way. Um, but as you can probably imagine, uh, given that, I've had a, a busy year and a half plus, um, and it doesn't really show, much, show many signs of slowing down. Um, I think you know, as Kyle alluded to in his remarks, there was about a 
10 plus year gap um, after Heller and McDonald uh, up until Bruin in 2022, where the Supreme Court really stayed out of the Second Amendment space. Um, there were no major substantive decisions issued, despite many uh, cert petitions. And that's clearly changed, I think, with the current court. Um, the court decided Bruin. Uh, we're waiting now for a decision in the Rahimi case. And there are many other challenges sort of waiting in the wings. Um, and I would expect the court to continue to take those cases in the coming years. Uh, so, so really excited to be here talking about these issues, especially at this time. Um, Kyle, I think, very, very ably summarized the uh, new historical tradition or text history and tradition test that Bruin, uh, that Bruin articulated for Second Amendment cases. Um, and I want to try to do two main things in my remarks today. Um, first, I'm going to offer a little bit of commentary on kind of what we're seeing in the lower courts at the moment, um, how courts are applying this test, where courts might be struggling. Um, and also try to situate my scholarship, um, the, the piece I wrote on the territories, the piece that I've written for uh, the Duke Law Journal, kind of within that landscape. Um, and then if I have time left, I'll go into a little more detail on the, uh, the piece that I've written for DLJ, which talks about historical court reporting and kind of specific challenges that that might pose for historically focused uh, methods like the one uh, that Bruin sets forth. So first, um, what's happening in the lower courts right now? How are the lower courts dealing with this change from tiers of scrutiny to text history and tradition? And I think no matter what your sort of normative view of Bruin is, um, it's relatively clear that many judges, federal and state judges, are struggling with this test. Um, and we know that because they're telling us that in the decisions that they're writing. Um, courts are writing, uh, judges are writing, for example, that uh, courts operating in good faith are struggling at every stage of the Bruin inquiry. Um, they're saying that historical consensus is elusive, that courts are not trained historians, that even the justices of the Supreme Court are not trained historians. Um, and they have implored the high court to answer some of the questions that Bruin both created and left unresolved. Um, these are some quotes I'm pulling from recent uh, federal and state court decisions over the past few months. Now, why is this? What, what accounts for this confusion, this frustration that we're seeing? I think there are a few high-level contributing factors, and I'm not going to say that this list is exhaustive, um, but first, you know, it's probably the case that any new doctrinal test is going to prompt some frustration and confusion among judges who are used to doing something different, um, who are used to the conventional tiers of scrutiny in, in applying the tiers of scrutiny in Second Amendment cases. Now they've been given a new methodology to apply. And so that's, that's somewhat uncomfortable. They're, they're struggling with it. Um, second, as I think you heard in some of these, uh, these quotes that I've pulled, judges aren't historians. Um, and it's probably true that they're not as comfortable dealing with historical evidence and historical sources as they are dealing with legal arguments. Um, especially when, as lower court judges, they don't always have the benefit of expert amicus briefs um, of the type that you might see filed before the Supreme Court. And there were many of those briefs filed in the Bruin case itself and in Rahimi. Um, third, I think it's true that the Supreme Court has left a somewhat confusing maze of dicta in the Second Amendment space, um, saying in some of its prior decisions that certain types of laws are presumptively valid, then deciding Bruin and I think in a lot of cases, it's not really clear how to square those two things, right? If the court says that a ban on felons possessing guns is presumptively constitutional, but the history doesn't show any similar laws, what is a lower court judge supposed to do? Um, and finally, judges, I think, are often viewing the history at very different levels of generality uh, in these cases. Some are requiring a very narrow, tight analogy to a historical regulation or set of regulations. Some are doing this inquiry much more flexibly. Um, 
And I think in addition to these high-level factors, frankly, courts are also a little bit confused by how the Supreme Court itself applied the Bruin test in Bruin. Uh, the court spent 20 plus pages going through various types of historical evidence in that case and the majority opinion, distinguishing certain historical laws, saying that they could not serve as support for New York's discretionary permitting scheme. And so I think that clearing up some of that confusion about what the court was actually doing in Bruin can potentially help to alleviate um, some of these uh, some of this confusion that we're seeing in the lower courts and potentially lead to uh, more consistency in applying the test. Now, how does how does my scholarship and, and the article that I've written, how do how do I sort of aim to to aid in that endeavor? Um, well, I want to focus today on this aspect of outliers, historical outliers. The Bruin majority says that some historical gun regulations are outliers, which seems to mean that they're not squarely within the American historical tradition of gun regulation, and thus they probably can't support modern laws, even if there is <coughs> relevant similarity under this analogical inquiry. Um, Professor Miller, along with Professor Bloker, has written on this concept and sort of how the, the term outlier suggests some kind of quantitative determination. Uh, maybe, you know, a law that is a certain distance from the mean or average of historical laws, but that really what the court is doing seems to be qualitative. Um, and there are a few different ways in which the Bruin court designated outliers and said that certain laws were outliers. And I want to explain how those moves might be problematic. Um, the court first suggests that some historical laws are outliers because of where they were enacted and where they applied. Um, Kyle mentioned the, the article I've written about the territories. I'm not going to get into that in, in much detail today, but I think it's a, an important and, and an underappreciated aspect of the Bruin decision, which is that if we're really looking to figure out what is the originally understood meaning of the federal Second Amendment, the territories might have an outsized role to play because the federal Second Amendment applied there directly, which it did not in the states uh, all the way up until McDonald in 2010. Uh, second, another way that the court suggests that some laws might be outliers is because of what happened after the laws were enacted. Um, maybe the laws weren't actually enforced. Maybe they were enforced in a discriminatory way around, around the time that they were passed. Or maybe they were not subject to judicial scrutiny at the time they were enacted. And the, the essay that I've written for, for DLJ, which is called Missing Pieces, focuses on this question of why does it matter that maybe some historical laws were not subject to judicial scrutiny? Um, what does that mean and kind of how is that relevant within uh, this text history and tradition test? I think at a high level what it means is that there's no record of constitutional or other legal challenges to these laws being adjudicated by courts shortly after they were enacted. So people didn't come into court around that time saying, I think this law violates the Second Amendment or challenging the law for other reasons. Um, this is a live issue in a lot of Second Amendment litigation at the moment. Uh, one federal appellate court recently directed the parties in a case on remand to, to brief the issue, to provide details about judicial scrutiny of relevant historical laws to the extent possible. And I think most scholars and judges have sort of assumed that there are two conclusions you could draw if you look back at the historical record and you see that there's not really any case law um, dealing with a certain regulation around the time it was enacted. First, this lack of scrutiny could suggest a constitutional infirmity. It could suggest, as the Supreme Court says in Bruin, that maybe this law isn't really part, squarely part of our tradition. Um, maybe it wasn't enforced, so there was nobody to challenge it, or people didn't think it would be important to, to challenge it. Um, it could be relevant because we don't have a court decision upholding the law, so we don't really know why people at the time thought the law was constitutional. Now, I think there's a flip side to that, which Justice Breyer uh, notes in his Bruin dissent, 
And that is that you could draw the opposite inference, right? You could say, well, maybe the law was followed and nobody thought to challenge it. Maybe everybody accepted that the law was constitutional, and that's why we don't have this decisional law from close to the time of enactment. Um, in my essay, I suggest what I think is kind of a third possibility, which is it could be that the law was subject to some kind of judicial scrutiny, especially maybe in, in lower levels of the state court systems at the time, but that we simply don't have any record of that because those decisions weren't preserved, they weren't preserved in a comprehensive way, either we don't know about them or we can't say, looking back, that the record of decisional law is complete. I argue in my essay that in some ways, Bruin seems to graft our modern day conceptions about court reporting and what kind of decisional law is actually available back to the founding era. Um, now, I'm sure it's not surprising to anybody that the situation around the time of the founding all the way up until the 20th century was far different than it is today, where we have almost any court decision easily at our fingertips through Westlaw, Lexis, state court websites, and so on. Um, but in fact, many early cases went unreported entirely. Um, state courts often didn't have requirements to issue written decisions up until at least the mid 1800s. And a lot depended on whether court reporters, who at the time were simply private individuals operating for their own financial gain, um, were able and decided to sit in on court proceedings or heard about those proceedings from their friends in the bar or so on. Um, and this actually extended in, in some sense to the Supreme Court as well. Um, there are sources saying that, you know, early on in the Supreme Court's history, when the court was sitting in Philadelphia, that there was simply no reliable and fast reporting system, and that counsel who were litigating before the court had to ask their friends whether the court had decided an issue of interest. Um, in fact, somewhat less than half of the dispositions by the Supreme Court in the first decades of, decade of its existence are not reported. Um, as, as I alluded to, uh, reporters also simply weren't motivated by the same factors and the same desire for comprehensiveness that exists today. Rather, they were motivated by profit. And in many instances, they weren't necessarily writing purely or mainly for a legal audience. Um, the, Amer the early American bar was quite small, um, and so it wouldn't have been commercially feasible for them to publish these court reporter volumes and target only lawyers, right? They were writing for the public, and therefore I think it's fair to, to say that they probably prioritized disruptive or interesting legal developments rather than trying to provide a complete picture of what was happening um, at the time. Um, I think this clearly would have impacted their choice, for example, of what cases to include or exclude. And you actually see contemporary reviewers criticizing court reporters in some instances for padding their volumes with cases that weren't that interesting or that um, the public wouldn't necessarily have cared about. Um, some cases at the time are also reported in the newspapers, and this continues through the 1800s. That's actually sort of the impetus for this project is that I, I found uh, uh, newspaper reports about state court decisions where there's no written or official record, right? The only record we have is a newspaper sto story saying a certain judge decided this issue. Um, but I think, you know, there's no way to know really how uh, comprehensive this, this reporting was. The early American press is very partisan. And so uh, it, it's certainly possible that that impacted uh, the decision of what to report on. Um, I'll, I'll conclude just by saying that I think, uh, you know, there, there's a real question, if, if all this is, is true, as I, as I detail in my essay, of, of what this means for a historically focused methodology like the, test, the text history and tradition test. Um, and I think the high level takeaway is that courts should be especially careful not to rely too heavily on the lack of judicial scrutiny historically just as they probably shouldn't give disproportionate weight to legislative silences, another area where uh, many scholars have, have criticized Bruin. We simply don't know uh, what a lack of judicial scrutiny really means and what might appear to be a lack of scrutiny could in fact be due largely to the lack of preserved decisional law from that time period. Um, and I argue that looking uh, outside of traditional legal sources to things like 
newspapers, letters, other evidence of context at the time, social context, may be one way to help fill in some of the blanks of what's missing from the record of decisional law, and that at the least, courts should not turn a blind eye to that kind of evidence. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this invitation to write and to speak. Um, my piece um, uh, is uh, called Historical Analogy and uh, the Role, Morality, and Reason Giving, and it is um, really an investigation about <clears throat> the relationship between this uh, analogical reasoning, historical analogical reasoning approach uh, in Bruin um, and what uh, some people uh, understand as uh, the role morality, that is the, the morality, the requirements, the norms of the judiciary in offering reasons for their decisions. Um, so the Supreme Court uh, uh, has turned ever more to analogical reasoning from history and tradition to decide major matters of public policy. Nowhere is this more evident than in the Bruin case. I will uh, recap a little bit, um, uh, although Kyle sort of covered the, many of the highlights of the Bruin decision. Um, it abandoned uh, the conventional scope and tailoring approach that the lower courts had been using and the court uses in other domains of uh, constitutional rights, uh, and instead um, um, articulated a new uh, focus on text history, tradition, and analogical reasoning therefrom. So Justice Thomas, in his Bruin opinion, says, quote, when the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct, the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. The government must then justify its regulation by demonstrating that it is consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. Now, the court recognized that not every modern regulation is going to have a historical equivalent. So, Justice Thomas, in his opinion, also says, when confronting present-day firearm regulations, this historical inquiry that courts must conduct will often involve reasoning by analogy, a commonplace task for any lawyer or judge. And he goes on to say, like all analogical reasoning, determining whether a historical regulation is a proper analog for a distinctly modern firearm regulation requires a determination of whether the two regulations are relevantly similar. The court declined to specify all the features that make two regulations relevantly similar, although the court did point to the two metrics that Kyle had mentioned, how and why the regulations burden a law-abiding citizen's right to arm self-defense. So the, the court's crafting of this analogical um, uh, reasoning from history and tradition, uh, had, and especially on uh, such a topic like guns of such significant social uh, salience, has thrust analogical reasoning to the forefront of judicial and academic debate. But rather than focus on um, uh, the workability, as many have, of the Bruin test, I really want to focus on these ethical implications of this type of reasoning in the Second Amendment cases and perhaps elsewhere. So role morality is the concept that the role one plays. I'm a professor, you're a student, uh, journal members, editors, uh, professors, doctors, parents, mentors, the president, and judges uh, must comply with a distinct set of norms and a distinct set of moral obligations by dint of them occupying that particular role. So if the uh, chestnut from uh, Alexander Hamilton is true, judicial decisions are authoritative because of their reasoning. Now judges can and sometimes do just exercise raw power. Uh, but when deciding cases, it's usually thought not morally and perhaps not even legally sufficient for justice, uh, judges to justify a decision by dint of their judicial commission alone. Rather, it is incumbent upon judges and judicial actors to offer what the legal process school called reasoned elaboration. Judicial reason giving is what distinguishes a society founded upon law as an exercise in public reason from an authoritarian or totalitarian regime. And a necessary condition of judicial legitimacy is that the judicial officer support her decision with reasons. Having reasons establishes that the decision is grounded in some kind of legal argument and not a product of will or chance. 
In the American practice of federal judicial review, which it empowers, as everyone understands, unelected life appointed officers to thwart the will of democratically accountable majorities, this makes the reason giving norms of judicial behavior all the more imperative. The justices write their opinions on the assumption that their decrees are going to be obeyed on the basis of consent rather than coercion. A judicial decision that nullified uh, a duly enacted piece of legislation that amounted no more than a naked assertion of judicial supremacy would put the judicial branch in a dangerously exposed political position and a decision whose reasoning is so convoluted or recondite that it is unintelligible may not provide much better cover uh, for such uh, behavior. So how does uh, analogy work into this? Lawyers and judges sort of describe reasoning by analogy, uh, and I'm sure I'm guilty of this as, as uh, uh, a professor as well, as one of the core competencies of the profession. But to be frank, in the dirty laundry amongst you know, lawyers is everything about this form of reasoning uh, is controversial, down to a fundamental disagreement about whether it is actually a form of reasoning at, at all, as opposed to a logical fallacy, the undistributed middle, or, or just a form of rhetoric. Uh, notwithstanding, everybody understands that its use in legal practice is everywhere, and I'm going to assume uh, that judicial reason giving um, is going to use analogy for the foreseeable future. So what is analogical reasoning? Well, as professors Fred Schauer and Bobby Spellman, uh, Professor Spellman is a, also a trained uh, psychologist, have explained um, analogs in terms of how people conduct them take the following form. You have a set of, a phenomenon that has a set of features, the source, and then a decision maker must assess some other uh, uh, set of phenomenon, the target. And then the decision maker makes a kind of um, connection between the source and the target, a process in the psychological literature that's called mapping. And based on these connections between the source and the target, renders the conclusion that um, the target is sufficiently similar to the source to be understood or treated like the source, or is insufficiently similar, is analogous or disanalogous. Now, much of the work of analogical reasoning, according to psychologists, is done in this mapping portion of this exercise, and it's also probably the most difficult and, in legal cases, the most consequential. So given that, quote, any two items have a potentially infinite number of points of similarity of points of difference, this is a shower, the mapping between the source and the target requires some kind of, and this is again a term that uh, Fred Shower has come up with, a rule of relevance to determine which similarities and differences matter and which do not. The example that's used in the Bruin case, if I recall, right, is something like green hats and green cars. They're both green, right? Um, so on the, you know, on the margin of color, they're analogous, but on the margin of what you can wear, they're totally disanalogous. So Spellman, uh, uh, Professor Spellman notes that mapping takes place along two tracks, attributes and relations. Attributes are these superficial or surface features uh, that are physically visible and uh, expressly described, so sort of color and shape, for example, or attributes. Relations are those links between those things like comparative size, bigger, smaller, or phenomena like causation. So in experiments uh, with laypersons uh, under time constraints, people will focus on surface attributes, but those with more time and training will consider relational similarities. And when asked uh, uh, to assess the quality of analogies in these experiments, again, amongst lay people, test subjects revealed um, that they thought that the better analogies were ones that uh, understood depth and structure and relational similarities rather than simply surface attributes. Moreover, the experimental data indicates that laypersons not only tend to ignore isolated or superficial similarities when to, uh, conducting some sort of analogical task, they also favor those features that exhibit some kind of uh, systematicity, correspondence that reveal some kind of overall uh, larger matching structure uh, that can be either task or goal uh, driven. So features or relations that can't be mapped onto larger set of higher order relationships tend to be disregarded in performing these analogical tasks when there's sufficient time to do so. Um, 
And cognitive science uh, experiments also suggest that both lawyers and laypersons measure the strength of the analogies uh, by this structural or relational uh, similarities. Lawyers and judges might be able uh, to better identify and articulate a rule of relevance and uh, perhaps are obliged for a rule of law reasons, but whether it's a lawyer or a layperson, it's the relational systematic aspects that appear to determine the strength of the analogy, not surface similarities or dissimilarities alone. So in a quote from uh, Fred Showers' um, uh, pieces, he says, uh, I think quite rightly, uh, this is a quote, when people perceive the blue car as similar to the red car, but not to the blue dress, for example, they're reflecting a world, or at least their world, in which the carness is ordinarily more salient than the blueness, and thus comes across to them as immediately and unreflectively obvious. So this is the conditioning about how people understand relationships be, between things. Um, and so the, um, uh, the context is quite significant in terms of how people, both lawyers and laypersons, make these analogical uh, judgments. Uh, and, as I mentioned before, whether an analogy or, uh, is good or bad, or analogical reasoning is good or bad, uh, tends to be driven uh, by some kind of systematicity of the two analogs rather than surface similarities. All right, so how does this play out in terms of uh, principled analogical reasoning from history and tradition? Well, first, I've tried to establish that reason giving is part of what uh, judges have to do. The second thing that I've uh, indicated is that both judges and laypersons operate in a world in which they're using analogical reasoning all the time. Now, the third part of this is about narrowing the gap between how judges might think or articulate a set of analogical relationships and how people might intuit those. So in the case of Second Amendment litigation, the courts often confront um, a threefold danger. The first is that they're going to lapse into uh, analogical processes driven by the surface rather than structural similarities. The second is a construction of analogs that can't be explained by any discernible or stable rule of relevance. And the third is the use of analogs that are so unmoored from public experience that they are going to appear unreasonable or contrived. Uh, and each of these dangers, as uh, Professor Willinger had uh, indicated, uh, have manifested themselves in some of the lower court decisions where you read it and you say, that's a really strange way of talking about it. It seems that there should be some other way of understanding this analogy than the way it's articulated in the opinion. <coughs> so what does this mean normatively? Um, well, first, um, <coughs> a publicly intelligible reason uh, must be sufficiently general to operate as a legal principle. So one of the aspects of reason giving in our system of common law adjudication is the decision, the analog, is designed you know, to cover the case uh, before the court, but also future cases, the cases that are you know, uh, going to come down later on. So um, to not do so um, is to fall into what's called the law of the churn fallacy. So in the path of the law, uh, Justice Holmes writes about some country justice in Vermont who has a dispute between two farmers over a broken churn. And he goes back and he looks all in his law books and he doesn't, you know, he looks everywhere and he doesn't see anything about churns and says, okay, judgment for the defendant, because I don't see any law about churns, where he should have been looking for laws about, you know, torts or the responsibilities of persons owe, you know, duties of, of persons owe, owe to others. Um, so it's got to be sufficiently general to operate as a legal principle so that it can decide future cases. Second, the rule of relevance can't drift too far from public intuition. You know, although the public is unlikely to have a fully informed uh, rule of relevance to address every contested Second Amendment issue, it's doubtful that they have no intuitions or about similarities and dissimilarities in this area beyond their own experience. So decisions about the rule of relevance, as stated by judges, that appear counterintuitive or drift too far from people's actual experience or understanding may threaten judicial credibility. An example that I've used in the past, but I think is relevant here, is um, <clears throat> Second Amendment adjudication right now talks about firearms in uh, common use, right? Common use for lawful purposes as being protected by the Second Amendment. 
you get some actual written opinions that will say, well, because this particular firearm, like an AR-15, is sold more than a Ford F-150 truck, therefore it must be in common use. But people don't have intuition, the people's intuitions are the common use is common use for self-defense. So as between different kinds of tools that are used for self-defense, whether they're sold more, that actually might make sense. But as between like one commercial product, like a Ford F-150 and an AR-15, that doesn't make any sense because people don't, these things are, you know, on the margin of whether one is sold more than another, that's not the way that people understand, you know, the role or the importance of firearms and whether they are in common use or not. Um, finally, the rule of relevance needs to be understood symmetrically, and this is uh, some of what Andrew um, had uh, said, Chris Wollinger had said, which is um, they have to be understood at a commensurate level of generality across the rights regulation uh, divide. This is not only for functional reasons, but I think for matters of public comprehension. So laypersons often appro uh, approach analogical tasks with regard to the systems in which they operate. So the selection of features of a source and the target will be the product of not just superficial similarities, but how they relate at, and, uh, in a web of context values and goals. So you know, an analog that's suitable along one margin uh, may be unsuitable uh, along another. So to, um, uh, to riff on an example that, uh, um, again, uh, Professor Shower uses, he says, well, look, uh, you know, if I told you that um, uh, an airplane is just like a bus, right, because they're both tubular and made out of metal and used for transportation, well, I guess on the, on the margin of transportation, yes, these are analogous, right? But if I told you that, therefore, the licensing for bus drivers and the licensing for you know people that fly aircraft should be exactly the same, um, you know, or that the, that the licensing for flying an airplane shouldn't be any more you know restrictive than driving a bus. I think your intuitions would be that would be um, absurd, right? Uh, and it's because we live in a world where we understand the, the the systematic relationships between it that make these things relevant on one margin but not on another. So in a similar way, when we talk about weapons. You know, a club and a firearm, for example, are both weapons. They might be analogous if the question is things that are usable for self-defense, but they're disanalogous if we think about their uh, relevant lethality. And so we might have a different kind of understanding about if it's broad enough for them both to be arms, we have a different idea about what is analogous on uh, the regulatory side. And in this way, a symmetrical level of generality for a rule of relevance <clears throat> it would promote um, the kind of system systematicity concerns that governs how the public assess the accuracy of reasoning by analogy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
you know, something along the lines of, you know, it seems that courts are struggling. What what type of guidance do you think we should provide, right, if we were to provide guidance, in our opinion? Um, the one that stands out to me is, is one that I, I referenced a little bit in my remarks, which is this, this legislative silence idea. It's kind of related to the judicial scrutiny point, but just this idea that you can sort of read silences in the past to have meaning that could almost be dispositive of the constitutionality of a current gun regulation. Um, I just don't think that's right. I mean, I, I don't think I don't think there's really any basis to assume that uh, historically legislator legislatures were enacting laws to the constitutional maximum at all times, which I think is what that that line of reasoning would require. Um, so that's what I'd say is I think the biggest thing that I think that the court hopefully would take a, you know, clearly say that's not what this test requires. Yeah, um, I uh, I totally agree with that. And I think um, if anything would come out of the Rahimi case that I would be um, um, happy about uh, would be clarifying the methodology and probably this I issue about thinking about <clears throat> the level of generality of analogies across the rights regulation divide. Now, you can say, well, that's just balancing again. But, you know, one way to understand it, um, if you're, if you're in, you know, inclined to originalism, is to say, well, um, this is just maintaining a balance that was set at the framing, right? You're not rebalancing anything. You're just, there's a set of, you know, uh, specified capacities to use lethal force or have weapons that are capable of lethality. And there's a set of regulatory things that, uh, you know, existed decide to offset the negative externalities that that might create. And this is just basically, you know, making sure the analogy is, <clears throat> is commensurate across the rights regulation divide is, is just basically maintaining the balance that was set at the framing. Now, you can have all kinds of debates about, well, what was that balance? Um, but that seems a, little, a, lot fruit, a lot more fruitful than it, what happened in Rahimi, which is looking around and trying to see, okay, let me try to find a, something that looks like a regulatory um, disarmament of somebody under a domestic violence restraining order in an environment where not a lot of people were really sure that, you know, um, hurting women in a you know, domestic setting was even a problem, uh, much less a crime. I mean, that's, that's, that's the kind of problem of, of Rahimi. So that's what I would hope for. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another question, how, how should the question that the court is asking, I think this gets to your, your scholarship, uh -huh. like what, what is the right set of similarities that we're looking at? How does that work with what Professor Willinger has identified of the just lack of, of maybe even a record of the, the potential sources for that? And so I'd like to hear how that changes what questions and I'd love to hear a little bit more about how um, some litigants are maybe introducing those other sources of, of law that you um, mentioned. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you know this is. It actually goes back to the to the um, exchange I was talking about earlier between Justice Justice Kagan and the Solicitor General, where, where this is another another aspect of of the sort of lower court confusion that the Solicitor General brings up, which is kind of a, a laser focus on certain types of historical sources, right? Saying that, you know, um, you know, ju judges are looking only at regulation or they're looking only at case law. Um, and some of, some of the scholarship surrounding Bruin, I think, supports something of a limited inquiry um, in the sense that, you know, you, yeah, you're, you're, you know, litigants are saying, you know, you only look to regulations or you only look to legal sources, not, you know, you don't want to expand the inquiry beyond that to include sort of broader contextual evidence about what was going on when some of these laws were passed. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think, I think that type of evidence in many cases is going to be crucial to actually understanding what these laws were, what they were, what was motivating these laws, you know, what the situation on the ground looked like after they were enacted. Um, I've done a little bit of work on sort of enforcement of historical laws, which is a really interesting question, very difficult to do, right? You have to kind of go back to archives and, and dig through, you know, oftentimes records that aren't digitized as far as, you know, who was actually being arrested for violating a concealed carry law, something like that. Um, but I don't know, I, I think it's important in my view not to sort of shy away from that type of evidence because I think it's important context, right? If you think about, you know, uh, something that might be sort of a societal norm regarding firearms that shaped how people acted outside of the formal law. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, I think I have two responses. One is related to my former one, which is depending on the level of generality, it might help solve the, you know, what do you do with historical silences problem, right? You're not going to have regulations or even maybe cases that are adjudicated on things that people don't consider problems. But if the problem is understood at a higher level of generality, if the problem isn't about domestic violence, but the problem is about you know, persons that are dangerous or persons that are subject to uh, intemperate behavior or something like that, then I'm, then I'm using other data points to uh, understand what am I trying to achieve in, in this commensurate rights regulation you know, uh, matrix that I'm working with. And, and so I don't have to find, you know, I, I, I don't have to make inferences from silences in the same way because I've got voice, but it's a different kind. Um, so, you know, that's one way uh, of, um, of addressing it. The other, quite frankly, I don't think is supplied by <clears throat> judicial doctrine as much as exogenous uh, norms about what you think the judicial role is. If you actually think that judicial restraint is a good thing, or if you think that um, for institutional reasons, judges are not really in a great position to make fine-tuned adjustments about big matters of public policy, then you know there's a, a kind of judicial minimalism version of this analogical approach that leaves lots of room for the political branches to do what they do best. Um, you know, um, the problem with Bruin is that in some ways it, it, it reads as an incredibly judicially empowering kind of uh, decision, but it, there's no necessary reason that it wouldn't be. And the, and the you know, how you do tiebreakers could be supplied by other things like, you know, Ely representation reinforcement. You can do Thayer deference. You can do all kinds of reasons about why the judges might say, you know, in I, I've got an absence of, of evidence, and therefore not I should decide or make an inference, but I should let the political branches then run um, in the space that that's that's left silent. 